Back in the time of the Buddha, becoming a Buddhist was a fairly simple affair. You heard a talk on the Dharma, you were inspired, and you would say to the Buddha or to the person giving the talk that you were taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha of monks. At some point the process became a little bit more formal. In the Kodakabhata, which is a later text in the, in the suttas, the very first passage deals with taking refuge. And you say it three times, not just once. It's that passage we have here many times. Bhutang Sonorangachami, Tamang Sonorangachami, Sangang Sonorangachami, then Dutyambi and Tatyambi, second time, third time. You repeat the phrases. But the question is, what does it mean to take refuge? There is another passage in the canon where they talk about the ideal lay follower. The ideal lay follower has five characteristics. One is that you are convinced of the Buddha's awakening. He really did awaken to the truth, what he learned about karma, what he learned about rebirth, what he learned about the Four Noble Truths. You take that as your guide. You take the Buddha's awakening as the event in world history by which you look at the rest of your life, you look at the rest of the world. We live in a world where the Buddha was awakened, where there has been a Buddha who has left behind his teachings. You try that world on for size, and you decide that it fits. I remember when I was becoming a Buddhist, one of the main breakthroughs, or milestones, I guess you would say, was when I realized that I had to depend on my own karma. Prior to that, I'd been raised a Christian, and even as I was beginning to have lots of doubts about those teachings, there was that strong sense that there was somebody up there who was looking after us, and suddenly realizing that if I were to be a true Buddhist, I'd have to drop that, it was a real milestone in my mind. It threw me back on my own actions. I really had to be more honest with myself, really had to be more careful about what I did. And that's what the passage in the canon talks about once you've decided that you are convinced of the Buddha's awakening, and the very first thing is that you live a life of virtue. This is why nowadays when they have formal ceremonies for people who want to declare themselves Buddhist, after you take the Triple Refuge, you take the Five Precepts, which means that you will not intentionally kill, steal, have illicit sex, take intoxicants, or lie. That's the second quality of becoming a Buddhist, or that makes you a, a genuine Buddhist. The third is that you do believe in the principle of karma. Expand on that. And the fourth characteristic, which is you don't look for protective charms, you don't look for a magical formula that will somehow undo your karma, which means that by the Theravada definition of a Buddhist, Vajrayana is not a Buddhist because I do believe in these charms and formula that will somehow undo your karma. Or even the types of other types of Mahayanas who believe that there is an outside power out there who will come over and just sort of take over and erase your karma for you. By Theravada standards, those are not Buddhists. You decide that when you're going to look for protection in your life, and this is what it means to take refuge, where you go to guarantee that you will not suffer. You have to go to your own actions. And then finally, the fifth characteristic is that when you make merit, you look first for the monastic Sangha. The word Sangha has developed many meanings, especially in the past couple of decades. By the time of the Buddha, it meant the Sangha of monks. Secondarily, the Sangha of nuns. But when you're making merit, you, look, you make merit there first. And of course, that doesn't mean you're not generous to other people. 
on the idea that you're really going to give a gift that will have great benefit. The Sangha is where you look first. So that's what the texts say. And John Lee adds that when you're taking refuge, it has many levels of meaning. The first level is that you take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, taking them as examples. This is how you're going to look for happiness in your life. Then you look at their qualities, and you try to develop them, both the qualities in terms of what made the Buddha a Buddha say, and then the qualities he had when he became a Buddha. That gives you three levels. The external level, then the internalizing level, and then find the level where the refuge has been internalized. It's that final level where your refuge is secure. After all, the Buddha himself, toward the end of his life, said, Take yourself as your refuge. Take the Dhamma as your refuge. And then you define that as practicing the establishing of mindfulness, which is basically how you get the mind into concentration. That's when you really do become your own refuge. On that second level, this level of practice, the level of internalizing. It's only when you've had your first taste of the deathless that you really are safe. That would be the level of fully internalized teachings. When you practice concentration, develop your discernment, and you realize that the concentration, even though it's a better pleasure, more stable pleasure than you can gain from sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, or thinking about things, it's still fabricated. And no matter how good fabricated things can be, they can fall apart. You want something that's not fabricated, something that's not liable to falling apart. And you investigate the various states of concentration, you realize that none of them qualify. It's when you realize that you're up against a dead end. that you can't stay in a state of concentration, you don't want to go anywhere else because nowhere else is going to be any better. That a third alternative opens up. That third alternative is the deathless. As the Buddha says, it's neither coming nor going nor staying in place. Another image in the canon that comes from a passage where Deva is asking the Buddha how he crossed over the stream. And he said, and the Buddha replied that he'd crossed over the stream neither by moving forward nor by staying in place. The deva was per perplexed. But the Buddha wasn't just being funny. We define space and time by either staying or moving. So an alternative that's neither space nor time has to be neither staying nor moving. And that's where the absolute refuge is. So there are many stages in the path to become a Buddhist. In terms of the world, you get to the point nowadays where people who study Buddhism as an academic subject will say that, well, anybody who calls himself a Buddhist is a Buddhist for their purposes. But what are their purposes? They're basically doing sociology. For our purposes, when you become a Buddhist, it becomes it comes to the point where you've made a change in your attitudes. You're really going to adopt the Buddha's point of view, the Buddha's analysis of how we suffer, why we suffer, and how we can stop. That puts you in a different world. It makes you a different person. It gives you more capabilities than you would have had otherwise. There's so many teachings out there that say you can't do this on your own. You have to depend on somebody else. The Buddha says you can do it on your own, you can do it with help, with guidance, but you have to do the actions yourself, and, but you are capable of doing this. That's the new you that comes when you really take on the, the Buddha's awakening as your guide. And of course, then the world, the world has this possibility. The teachings are there, they're still alive, and the opportunity to practice is still there. The door is open, as the Buddha would say. Show your faith. 
you, know, you don't just say that you believe in these things, you actually act on those beliefs. Observing the precepts, looking for your security in skillful actions. That's when you've made the important step in becoming a Buddhist. <laughs>